welcome back, everybody. I hope you were able to grab a coffee and um, get a bit of a croissant and get some networking going. That's, that's what these events are all about. I saw some good conversations happening, and I've seen some people I haven't seen for ages, so lovely to have you back. Um, so welcome to this session where we are looking at creative community engagement around data science and AI. This is a theme which we at the, at the JGI um, have invested a great deal of time and effort in because we think it's in incredibly important to understand the public discourse around data science and AI and to use the tools that are being developed in a positive way within communities. We're going to have two short presentations here. Um, one by me and my colleague at the JGI, James Thomas, here. So we're going to have, have a little bit of a box and cox here. And then we're going to hand over to Ernesto Schwartz-Marin from Exeter, um, who's going to be talking about his case study in Mexico. So first of all, um, James and I are going to tell you a little bit about our DataFace project. DataFace is a collaboration that we have been working on for three years now with Cheltenham Science Festivals and Cyber First to deliver learning opportunities for year nine and 10 children in UK schools to engage with data science principles. The, the issue is really that while data science and AI is, is very much at the heart of public discourse at the moment, there are only very limited mechanisms within the curriculum for teachers to engage in discussions with students, either about the importance of data um, or how to use it, or even what kinds of careers they might be in data science and AI for their students. So, so this began as a collaborative effort to try and fill that gap and provide a mechanism with which tools for, for, for teachers and their students to come together and embrace data science, understand what it really means, and use it to tell stories, use it to explain the narrative of the findings that they create through their own work. So it enables young people to tell the stories they care about through the gathering and presentation of data. Um, when I was talking to my daughter, who's a school age, about this, and she said, yeah, mum, that's really great because, you know, data skills are life skills for Gen Z, and I promised her I'd use that quote. <laughs> so, Charlie, that one, that one is for you. Um, but I think there is a very real sense in which this is, this is true. Um, we need to help young people understand the relationship between the data and everyday life and the tools and the games and the, the fora and the, the kind of online resources that they use as a very core fundamental part of their interactions with each other and the communities in which they live. We need to help them develop a sensitivity to the ethics and security implications of those data. Um, we need to make efforts just to improve data literacy generally so that you know, communities as a whole are able, to, are feel empowered to take decisions based on based on data science and based on the findings that are communicated to them about data, data science. And of course, it's really important that we have a diverse group of people engaged in data science professionally. And we need to be able to show that there are lots of routes into, into employment which will, um, which will require these skills and that those are that people of, of all backgrounds and all skill sets can actually engage with that. So we get the best of the kind of, cre of, the kind of creative passion that we all need for these fields. Um, I've kind of said that really, haven't I? Problem solving, digital content creation, communication and collaboration, and data literacy. So three years ago, DataFace was born out of that conversation, directly with teachers as well, through Cheltenham Science Festivals, through Cyber First and the University of Bristol. And since then, we have gone on to have support from a number of other partners. So Amazon Web Services have provided two years of sponsorship to support this development of the, of the work. Cheltenham Borough Council, DSIT. Uh, so thank you all for coming together with us through this journey. Um, and what we aim to do with DataFace is to engage students in, in all aspects of what I've described here as, the, if you like, the data science life cycle. So at the top there, there's issues around data capture. How do we capture data? What's the mechanisms we use? What's the tools we use for actually generating these data? Sensors, IoT, instrumentation. 
How do we then maintain that? How do, we, how do we know what's missing in our data sets? How do we create infrastructure that is fit for purpose in the modern world? And then the processing and curation of that is really important skills there about reproducibility, about reliability, about trustworthy environments. If you get all that right, then you can start thinking about the analysis. How do I aggregate these data sets? How do I label them? How do I learn or optimize processes based on them? And then the last piece there is communication. How do I then visualize those findings for a wider audience? How do I tell stories based on that? How do I then allow us to make decisions on the back of that? And then perhaps the most important part of this graph of all is that final arrow that takes us back to data capture, because that's where the positive feedback loop starts. So I'm going to hand over to James to tell you a little bit more about how we actually went about creating materials for the kids in schools. Thanks Kate. So I'm just going to go back a slide just uh, <coughs> briefly to Kate's um, cycle there and you know pe people that work in, in anything related to data science as Kate has said know that a lot of effort goes into the, the curation of the data and the pre-processing of the data and exploring um, you know, if we collected the right data, what, what about missing data and things like that. So in order for this project, <coughs> so that the students at the, in the schools could concentrate on the data visualization, the realization of the data and how they communicated that data, we wanted them to look at this kind of left-hand side, uh, this analysis communication and then back to data capture boxes. So we produced a series of curated data sets kind of big data for, for people that you know, haven't used data before, so it's, it is a, a spreadsheet of data. That's how we provided it to them. And we produced uh, four data sets, and I'm gonna try and remember which ones they are now. There's a, a data set on gender equality across the world. There's one on environmental protection issues across the world. There's one on how sea level rise impacts different communities across the world. And there's a UK-based data set on the cost of living crisis that, that we're experiencing at the moment. And we've uh, consolidated data from a number of different sources, and then we've provided it in the spreadsheet format, so it's all sort of in a familiar format to them. And to give you an example, you know, I'm not going to go through them all, but in, in this, this is a data set here on um, gender equality across the world. So we've got issues uh, for each country, things like the population, the development status, the GDP of that country. But then we've also got data on life expectancy, both for the entire population, for female and male within that population. We've got adult literacy rates, fertility rates, and then we've got a number of kind of yes, no binary features here on are the, are the rights of women the same as the rights of men within that country. So there's lots of kind of potential for them to, to look at issues here. And these were definitely co-created with, with the teachers in the schools. So we came up with ideas and said, well, we you know, if we were using this data, we might look at this kind of issue. And then, I mean, some of the things that we'll show you in a second, when the students actually got to grips with this data, they went down a, you know, a completely different route that we hadn't expected them to go down, and that was really pleasing to see. So you might, might think about how, how we actually went about sort of allowing schools to deliver this. One of the things we found when we worked with the uh, initial pilot schools was they all came from very different places in terms of the, what their students had been taught and how comfortable the teachers were with this kind of material. Some of the schools, they had computer science teachers or IT teachers who were interested in delivering this. Other schools, at one of the schools, we had an English teacher who was delivering this and they, they wanted more sort of scaffolding to help them with, with what the tasks were going to be. So, through a sort of consultation process with the schools, we decided to produce some videos that, were, that are shared online that both the students at the school can use in order to learn sort of basic data skills and using Excel if they don't know that already, and then also skill, data science skills and, and those sort of softer skills. And then also, those videos could be used by the teachers as well so that they could become comfortable with these areas if that was something that they um, aren't used to. So, I'll show you a few of those videos now, just sort of a, a, some clips from them. And one of the really nice things is that we got some of our uh, colleagues at the University of Bristol, uh, some of them who are wearing the kind of pink and purple t-shirts today, to act as role models and be in these films. So it's really good that we're using them to inspire the next generation of, of data scientists. So the, the first video here is, shows you one of the core skills 
as we call them, which is how you might actually go about uh, actually working with the data. In this video, we will learn about how we can explore our data with sorting and filtering. We will use the data on trees that we saw in the introduction video. As you might remember, this is showing data on all the trees in the city of Bristol. There are a number of different columns. Some of them contain numbers and some words. Let's look first at answering some simple questions about the trees. For example, let's say that we want to find the largest trees in the data set and see what species it is. Before we do so, why not pause the video and think about what kind of trees you think it might be. Okay, so let's try to find the answer. First, we should think about how we define the largest as we have a number of choices. For now, Right, so I just paused that one there. It then goes into more detail. So the video is about five minutes long in total, and it goes through a number of different techniques that, that we found that they would probably want to use um, when, when analyzing the different data sets we've been provided. It's probably worth saying that the, the pilot schools that were originally involved, we, we didn't give them any of this. We just gave them the data sets. We gave the teachers some assistance. And we said to them at the end, what resources would have been helpful to you? What, what, what would have made it easier for you to attack this problem? And you know, it was these kinds of videos that resulted. So on the next video I'm going to show you a little preview about PROM is what we've termed power skills. So these are the sort of the more sort of thinking skills around data science. And this video is on maintaining the integrity of data. And it's done as a, a kind of group discussion session between our uh, role models. So when you're thinking about the integrity of the data that you're using, one problem that I think uh, you run into quite a lot is when you have like missing rows or columns uh, of information that you sort of wanted in your data set and for whatever reason you weren't able to collect them. And oftentimes it's kind of case by case basis when you're trying to think about like, you don't want to try and draw conclusions of data that's not there, but at the same time, um, you you don't want to just sort of filter out all your data and maybe kind of completely lose variables because you've been like, well, I'd like to collect this, but it's not as present. Uh, and so when I've been working with medical data, because it's data that's collected by uh, medical practitioners, clinicians and stuff, they'll oftentimes they won't collect all the same data every single time. Um, they'll um, and so there's always missing bits of data. And so you have to make the decision, do I remove this data? Do I do something that sort of tries to fill in the gaps in a way that's sort of reliable? For example, if a patient's temperature is, is 37 degrees uh, at four o'clock and it's 37 degrees at five o'clock, but I wanna know what it is at 4.30, is it, is it fair to assume it was probably about the same? Uh, and thinking about whenever I draw conclusions from that kind of thing, how much do those conclusions rely on whatever I've done to the data to mitigate that, that, those missing values? Yeah, and being aware of kind of where the missing data is. So if you're maybe doing a survey that's involving people from the city and people from the countryside, um, if all of your missing data are from... Okay, I'll pause that one there. I'll move on now just to uh, one of the introductory videos to the data sets that we provided to the schools. This is uh, about the environmental protection data set. I'll just play another couple of minutes from this one. Welcome to the data first introduction to the environmental protection open data set. We talked to young people about what issues matter to them and what questions they wanted to focus on. One topic they were interested in was how different countries around the world impact the natural environment. We looked at what data was available to explore those issues and how it could be interrogated to answer their questions. In this video, we will look at the environmental protection data set that we have prepared for you. This data was taken from the World Bank's Open Data website. The World Bank is an international organization representing nearly 200 countries. Their mission is to end extreme poverty and reduce income inequality. They compile data from many different sources and make it free and easy for anyone to find online. 
there is no doubt that we humans are changing the natural environment of our planet. Our overconsumption of natural resources, intensive farming, and growth of cities lead to the destruction of ecosystems. So the video goes on to, to talk about more of the issues uh, that are shown in the data set and then also goes through the data set column by column explaining what, what the columns mean and what the units are. And again, it's, it's a sort of about a five minute video. One of the challenges we set of the, the schools that are involved is how can you make this cross-curricular within your school? And I think we found before this that many of the schools, as you, as you said, Kate, operate kind of within silos within the different departments of the school. And we wanted schools to see that data science problems, they're not just computer science or IT problems. You know, they're very much multidisciplinary issues involving, you know, here are a few of the, the subjects that were involved in the trial phase uh, at, at some other schools. And we also, when we say kind of data visualization and we want them to produce compelling data visualizations or data realizations, we didn't want them to just produce a graph on a PowerPoint slide or something like that. We wanted them to produce something more than that. So I'll give you a little view of these are works from a couple of the data artists and data journalists that the project has worked with. And they've also produced videos to try and inspire the students to say, these are the kinds of things that you should look at. So there's one here on kind of death tolls due to different uh, pandemics in the past, uh, which is a sort of a digital one on the, on the left-hand side. In the center, there's a, a project uh, called Dear Data, where Stephanie Pozovec, a, a data artist and data journalist, wrote on postcards and sent those to a friend every week of her, li of her life for a year, different, uh, different topics or different things that she'd been through and she documented them with little mini data visualizations on postcards. And I think that those finished postcards have now been published as a book and are now displayed and held in the permanent collection of uh, MoMA in the, in the United States. And then finally, on the very right-hand side at the bottom right, there's a visualization of air quality in a city, I'm not sure which city, in the UK, and then the, the big kind of red spiky one there is bonfire night, uh, which has got much lower air quality because of all the fireworks and bonfires. And that, this is actually a necklace, that, so it's actually kind of wearable uh, data as well. So after the first couple of years of this project, what did the students come up with at the schools? Well, we're very impressed and very pleased to say that they came up with kind of similar sorts of visualizations. Let's switch to Kate to talk about some of these. Yeah, so we had a um, wonderful exhibition actually at Cheltenham Science Festival um, of the works that the, that the students had made um, through this project. So just to give you a few examples, the one on the left there, um, they use the data set around um, gender equality and access to education. And they've actually created a... I don't know how, how much their library would have been happy about this, but I'm looking at a librarian now. <laughs> They created a, a physical book that you can open and feel and touch, um, and you can see that they've they've painted the the sides of the of, of of the pages. They've stuck them together in proportion to the numbers of children in different age classes, and they've coloured the edge so that you can kind of guess which is which is the boys and which is the girls. Um, and you can see the inequality in different in different parts of the world from that. And you can this is something you can actually kind of hold and touch. Um, and then on, on the right there, we've got um, some, some, some more recent uh, data visualizations around, I think that one on the left is the sea level. That's the sea level it's rise all, one. Oh, so this is all gender equality. Okay. So this is different schools coming up with different mechanisms for, for kind of telling the same kind of story. Um, what was the next one? And this is also, this is also um, gender equality. So this is, I like this one. This is from this year. Um, this was year nine, I think. So it's women on one side, which is the side we're facing, and you can walk around it, and it's, it's men on the other side, and they're wearing the national dress of the countries which are involved, and they're scaled to show the proportions of, of young men and young women in, in education. And I thought that one was particularly successful because it also has the question at the bottom that, that the data visualization is answering which I thought was interesting. Not all of them did that, but I thought this one was particularly successful 
because it did that. And just talking to the kids, one of the videos actually is the students talking about their own experiences and just hearing the, how animated they are um, about their, their impression of the programme and what they got out of it and the team working. One of them says in the video, well, I, I signed up to do this because then it would mean I didn't have to do the other thing. I can't remember what the other thing was. Um, but by the end of the year, I'd made all these new friends and I'd realised that this is something that I could do in the future. Fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Um, this one is around um, environmental protection. So this is a very large poster, actually. You don't really get a sense of the scale, this giraffe on the left. Um, and the tree with the graded colours is the, um, the plant life which is endangered. So the higher you go up the tree, the more, um, the more plant, types, plant species are endangered. And the, and the neck of the giraffe, each individual spot is actually the outline of a country and the, and the colours represent the numbers of animal species which are, um, which are endangered in the, same, in the same country. So you can kind of read across. I particularly like that one and they were very good at presenting it as well. Um, this is the sea level rise, so two different takes on how to present sea level rise data. This one on the left um, is a laser cut uh, plastic, you can take out each individual, each, each layer is an individual country and it shows the amount of, of land which would be covered by water with one metre and what's the other? Now, now and one metre, that's right, now and one metre. Um, and you can actually take it out, kind of interrogate it, put it back in, and it's lit, it plugs in, and it's it kind of backlit, which really, uh, really successful, I think. And then using the same data, a lovely little fish tank, which is actually in a tank. Um, and you, again, you can see um, how much, the, there's a scale on the right, probably a bit small on this, on this slide, there's a scale on the right to show um, sea level rise and, and, how many, and how much area would then be covered by water. So we were really, even our kind of expectations about what the, the young people might produce was really challenged by this, and we got great feedback from them. And it was partly through the feedback that we included a fourth data set for this year, which is around cost of living crisis. So we've worked, James has worked with ONS data to produce a fourth data set, so we're we're kind of assuming we might get, I don't know, um, shopping baskets and things represented in, in next year's um, Cheltenham Science Festival, which is happening this week as well. Um, so there'll be an exhibition of this work next year as well. So that's data phase. That's one example of how we are working to, to use data and to think about training around data to empower the next generation in a very community focus. Um, and now I'm going to hand over to Ernesto schwartz marin to give the second half of this lecture. So Ernesto is a lecturer in sociology and assistant director of the Global Systems Institute in Exeter, and he's going to talk about his work in Mexico, also showing a video, I think. So over to you, Ernesto. Thank you. 